Good evening, viewers, and very warm welcome to the 16th episode of the Meet the Media Veteran series. Today, in the episode, we have an award-winning producer, writer, and director from USA. She is someone who is not only CEO of an entertainment company, but also is a prolific writer, speaker, and multiple award-winning producer director. Before presenting our detailed introduction. May I first welcome the veteran film producer, writer, director, Miss Lane Shafter, to the show. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Lane, for joining us today. It's such an honor, you know, for having you on the show today. I'm so thrilled to be included. I am honored as well. Thank you so much. So before I formally begin the uh, show, uh, let me uh, give the detailed intro of uh, Miss Lane Shafter. Lane Shafter Bishop is a multi-award winning producer director who has received numerous accolades for her work including an Emmy, six Tally Awards, a Videographer Award, three Communicator Awards, a Cheryl C. Corbin Award, an Aurora Award, a Davi Award, a New York Festivals Award, and DGA Fellowship Award for Episodic Television. Currently, Ms. Bishop is the CEO of Vast Entertainment, the go-to book to screen company with numerous projects, both completed and in active development, including producing feature films, the dub for CBS Films and Lionsgate, and assassination games for MBCA, both based on books. She has produced TV series, The Brain Trust for NBC, Confessions of a Sociopath for Universal Cable Productions, and The Forgetting for Netflix, all based on books. She has also produced the limited series, The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein for Sony Picture Television and also based on a book. Writing, producing, directing numerous TV movies for Lifetime, including His Secret Marriage, He Knows Your Every Move, Wicked Mom's Club, Blood, Sweat and Life, and The Talking Game. And directing the film movie, A Brother's Honor for Passion Flix, based on your time best-selling author Brenda Jackson's popular novel. Additionally, Ms. Shukar is also a contributing writer to, the, to both both Boss Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine, is a three-time speaker at WGA and numerous writers' conferences, and is author of Tell Your Story in Single Sentence, Advice from the Front Lines of Hollywood, published by prestigious WW Norton Company. The book hit number one on Amazon in the new release five times before its actual release date. In an outline into CNN dubbed her the book worshipper of Hollywood. Ms. Bishop holds a BA in literature from UC Santa Barbara and an MFA in production from the USC School of Cinema and Television. She is a director member of the Directors Guild of America and the Academy of Studies and Arts and Sciences. It is such an honor having Ms. Lane Chapter Bishop on the show today. May I request Lane to kindly deliver a talk on indie feature film production? Thank you. Thank you for that lovely, uh, very long introduction. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, yes, I would love to talk about independent film production since uh, feature production is sort of my uh, bread and butter right now. Um, I thought I'd go back a little and start with how, how I got started uh, being a producer and director and now writer. Um, of course, I went to USC Film School for my master's, uh, which helps, but uh, I sort of decided about halfway through that uh, it would be smart for me to start my own production company because you have to build a reel. Uh, you have to be able to show what you can do. And in film school, um, ironically, there's not a lot of opportunities to do that, um, especially, I hate to say it, but as a female, you know, they would say like, oh, the girls in the class can do makeup and, you know, script supervision and, you know, not really where I wanted to go. I wanted to be a director. I knew I wanted to be a director. And, um, I directed theater uh, prior. So uh, I ended up starting my own production company about halfway through USC film school, halfway through the master's program. And I basically had this idea of, I will keep directing till someone pays me to direct. <laughs> so I did public service announcements. I did industrials. I did music videos for friends who had bands. It was really anything I could get my hands on um, to start to build a reel of material. Um, my biggest break was when I was able to get uh, a chance to do Rock the Vote for MTV, which I believe they still have today, to get young people to vote. And it was a very controversial, um, very controversial piece. So that um, 
that got me some accolades and, and helped, you know, get going. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the tough things, again, as I mentioned earlier, was being a female. Um, have, having a female director was just not the thing at that time at all and hasn't been for, you know, 20 years. It's slowly changing now, thank goodness. Um, but I got lucky because my name was Lane, obviously, and it didn't give away that I was female. If it was Stephanie or Jennifer, I probably would have had a little more difficult time. Uh, but because it was Lane, I actually ended up being able to pitch in rooms that maybe I wouldn't have gotten into otherwise. And and you could tell the minute you walked in that they thought you were going to be a guy. <laughs> they kind of looked like, oh, you're female. Okay. So it was uh, it was quite interesting. Um, but I got a lot of extra opportunities, I think, that way to, to pitch my vision for various projects. Um, because I did get called in because they thought I was male. <laughs> it's a very weird thing, but there you go. Um, I've been directing now more than 20 years. Uh, the last 10 of those, I've also been a producer. A lot of people ask like, what do you prefer? Would you rather be director, producer? You know, what's the difference? You know, it's, it's a tough thing to answer. Um, as a director, usually at the time, you're very focused on one project. You're doing one film. So your whole world is that film. And if that film's not going well, emotionally, it's very difficult, right? It's, so you're kind of on this roller coaster of, you know, if it's going well, you're here. If it's not going well, you're here. It's, it, emotionally, it's, it's rather difficult um, because your whole world is one project. Um, I love it because I love the onset part of it, the shooting and working with actors. I'm an actor's director. There's two different kinds of directors. Uh, usually there's a technical director who's more about, ooh, look at the nifty, flippy camera thing. And then there's actors, directors. I came from theater. I work with the actors. I think that performance is what the audience is watching. Everything else is gravy. So, you know, I, I like that part of directing, but I understand the emotional part of it is tough. Um, as a producer, you have many projects. I have probably 20 projects right now as a producer. So it makes it a lot easier emotionally because if one's going well, one's not going well, they sort of, you know, help you. You're like, well, that one tanked, but at least that one's going great. So emotionally, it's much easier, I think, uh, to be a producer um, in, in many ways. Uh, also, as a producer, you're creating your own work. You know, as a director, you're waiting for the phone to ring. Um, it's one of the reasons I started uh, producing because I didn't want to wait for the phone to ring. I wanted to to create my own work. So, so I guess it's a it's a fine line of which is better. You know, um, and I think uh, you know the nice thing about creating your own content is that you really can pick what you want to focus on. What what interests you? You know, I I remember uh, hearing this author that I work with, very, very famous author, Ann Perry, uh, speak. And someone said to her, oh, should I, should I write about what I know? I always hear, uh, write about what you know. And she had this great answer, very prolific. She said, write about what you care about. No one cares what you know. I love that. Answer. So I always try to find projects that I really care about. Uh, doesn't matter what the trend is or whatever. Yes, I care if it sells, but I, I focus on things that I really care about. And I think that's why they sell, because I think you sell on passion, you know, your passion for that uh, material. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I combined the two things that I love to create my company, which was I was a literature undergrad. Um, at UC Santa Barbara. So I always loved books and literature. And then I went to USC film school. So I basically decided I'm gonna, if I'm going to create my own content, I'm going to combine the two things that I love, literature and film. So uh, that's what I did. Um, and since then, my company has sort of become the go-to book to screen adaptation company, which is awesome. Um, when I started Vast, you know, it, it was at a time where Hollywood really ironically, really did not want books. Um, you know, it was all an executive could do to spend, you know, time reading a 120 page screenplay. So when you came in, you said, hey, I have a 300 and whatever page book. They looked at you like, oh no, I really do not want to spend my time on that. So it was tough. And I, I had to figure out how do I sell a book without having to make them read a book? And um, so where that, uh, went from there is that I thought maybe what I need is a log line is a really good log line. And that's a one sentence uh, selling tool. Sometimes they used to call it the elevator pitch. Um, but I realized slowly but surely that when I would ask, you know, an author's agent, Hey, could you send me the log line for the book? 
they were a mess. They were an absolute, they were like an amalgamation of sort of a, a bad back of the book summary. It, they were terrible. And I thought, I, I got to craft a way to sell these myself because this isn't working. So I slowly but surely created a way of making log lines from your material. And as I went to more writers conferences, I realized, wow, all these authors are asking for this information. How do I make a log line? And so eventually it became a book uh, for me that I wrote um, called Sell Your Story in a Single Sentence. And I used that sentence uh, to grab the executive's attention. Um, and basically a log line is a one sentence selling tool because it, it highlights what's most unique about the material. And it, it's how I sold. Uh, and, and in the first year, the reason CNN called me the book whisperer is because I sold, you know, it, it, literally I set up 13 projects in my first year. And it's because of the log line. And I'll give you a, my favorite example uh, of a log line. My favorite example is um, this woman came to me and she bought me her book. And it was her true story. And it was about her, uh, you know, being a drug meal and getting into drugs. And her boyfriend was into drugs and they ended up in prison. And I thought, God, I've, I've heard this story. I saw the movie Traffic. You know, what's different about this? I always ask, what's unique about this? And after a while of speaking to her, we finally got down to sort of the heart of the matter, which is that, well, I, I'll, I'll give you the log line and you'll know what's unique about it. The log line ultimately became the true story of a woman who at only 19 ran the biggest drug cartel in U.S. history. So now I've taken what's unique about it and highlighted it. So now I can sell it, right? And that's really the idea behind log lines. And that's, that's how I start every pitch uh, to any exec, whether on the phone or in person, it's with a log line um, because that's really how I sell. And I'll be talking about this in a lot more detail, obviously. I think it's on uh, June 20th, also at 8.30 a.m. Pacific, um, yes. talking about my book and how how you create a log line to help sell your material. It's great for, for writers uh, of any kind or actually for anyone selling anything because someone is always gonna say to you like, oh, what are you working on? And this gives you a very brief, perfect selling tool answer. So that's why I love log lines. Um, so once I had these log lines, um, I, you know, I had to make sure I had an ongoing stream of material. So, you know, the good news is <laughs> after Harry Potter came out and Twilight came out and Hunger Games came out, amazingly enough, somebody, everybody was like, oh, books, where have these been? Which is great because uh, suddenly I was in the arena that everybody wanted to be in. Um, and so that helped. And also I had already sort of developed relationships over all of this time with about, I think there are about 70 writers agents now that I work with in New York. They represent the authors of novels. And what I love about them is that they have the rights, what they call the performance rights, to most of their material. That's what you need as a producer. Um, if you go to the publisher, they usually have the performance rights for only maybe 5% of the material that they publish. And plus they're slammed. There's a million people writing them and bothering them. And so you really don't get uh, the access that you need. Whereas I have now developed friendships with, with all these agents and you know that is how I get material. And I actually ended up focusing on early, early sneak peeks at material because Hollywood has this, uh, this formula. So when you go in and you pitch and you say, I have a book, they say two things. How many books have sold and is it a bestseller? I hate these questions <laughs> because once you set up the project and produce the project, it becomes a bestseller and a ton of books sell. So it really doesn't matter prior to that, but that's the only way Hollywood knows how, how to deal. And also it's tough because in terms of box office, Hollywood is used to hearing millions, right? Millions and millions at the box office. In books, if you sell 40,000 books, it's considered a ginormous hit. But if you say to Hollywood, oh, 40,000 books have sold, they look at it like, that's nothing. They don't have the right perspective. So I was trying to figure out how to get around those two questions. And the, the way that I do it is basically, I started saying to all the agents, I need early, early stuff, stuff that hasn't gone to publishers yet. Because now I don't have to answer any of those questions because it's not even published yet. Plus I get it before other people even know it exists. So that's great. 
But on top of that, I have two big pluses. The first plus is I can adjust the material for the buyer. So if I know they want a certain thing and it's kind of in the book, but kind of not, I can go back to the agent and the author and say, hey, would you be willing to play this up a little bit? Because I think it'll sell to whoever. It, it really allows me to adjust the material because it's not published yet. But on top of that, I have ammunition with the executive where I can say, guess what? You're getting a sneak peek at material that hasn't even gone to publishers yet. Lucky you, right? So it gives me ammunition. So I have a lot of different little, little reasons why I love early sneak peek at material stuff. I do have clients like Ann Perry, who I just set up uh, her stuff as a TV series, who's been around forever. I mean, she, she has books on books and books. She has 27 million books in print, I believe. But I also have a lot of new authors no one's ever heard of because to me, content is king. If it's something I can sell in a sentence and it's really great, fantastic. I don't, I don't care if you're a brand new writer or really, really famous. Um, I just need it early. I need it early enough that I can sell it on you're looking at something no one else has gotten to see. Isn't that cool? Um, that's a really, really helpful tool uh, for me as a producer. Um, the other thing is I think that a lot of people tend to go straight to publishers because they think that's the way to get the material. So I always try to educate and say, you know, most um, most publishers just remember they, they have, you know, maybe it's getting a little bit higher now because they've realized the value of books, but so maybe they have the performance rights to 10% of their material. Still doesn't help you that much. It's still much better to, to deal with the agents of the authors. And by the way, most authors these days have their own website. So they tell you exactly who to contact if you're interested in a book. Um, this uh, underlying, what they call underlying IP or intellectual property, by the way, is very valuable these days now. Um, I can take in two equal projects. One, just a script, done. One, a script, but it's based on a book or an article or a short story or, or, or. And if you bring in those two things, the one with underlying IP, underlying intellectual property, like a book or a short story or a narrative from a, a magazine, et cetera, that is gonna sell first because that is valuable. That inter intellectual IP has become incredibly valuable. So for me, having everything I do based on books uh, has become a huge benefit where at the beginning, nobody wanted books. In fact, if you said book, they almost ran from the room. So <laughs> it's pretty good now. Um, but this IP is very, very valuable. I tell screenwriters sometimes when I speak at writers conferences, you know, if your screenplay is uh, not in fact based on IP, go to the internet, find an article that talks about the topic that you are exploring in your screenplay and copy it off and say, this was inspired by this article. Give yourself IP, it's ammunition. It will help you sell. Um, so let me talk a little bit about now uh, the actual producing, directing, writing. Um, I ended up writing, by the way, because as a director, you're kind of always rewriting the scripts you're given nine times out of 10. Uh, so it kind of saved a step. But also, um, I'm very big on structure, three act structure, because my feeling is if you have a, a you know, like a bad blueprint, you're going to build a bad house, whatever it is. So if you want that structure, you know, the structure has to be good to have the end result be good. So that that's where I began writing. And also, you know, a lot of screenwriters on the independent level, they tend to be really good at character and dialogue, but not structure. So I found myself sort of teaching structure to every screenwriter I worked with. And so <laughs> to expedite the process, I ended up just writing them. Um, the nice thing is I have no ego about that part of it. I always tell the actors, make it your own. If you can change the line to make it sound more like what you would say, fantastic. Um, I do films. These are definitely independent. Uh, approximately most of them 14 day shoots. So, so very, very fast. Um, you have to know what you're doing. You have to what they call shoot to edit. So in my brain, I'm already editing, making sure it'll cut together. Anything you get above and beyond just simple editing it together is you know, gravy, you plan out your master shots very carefully to have the least amount of coverage. It's a lot of, a lot of planning. Um, the good thing is we're in 4K land now. You shoot everything in 4K. 
So for me, that's fantastic because when I started as a director, you had to shoot a medium shot and a close up and an extreme close up of everything. Now, if I shoot a medium shot, the close up and the extreme close up are within there. I can punch in up to, I think it's 210% or something in 4K and deliver as if I've shot that coverage. I'm creating my own coverage by punching in. Uh, it's a lifesaver. Uh, it saves you a ton of time, um, literally a ton of time on set. I've even done silly stuff where I've shot, you know, a two shot of two people sitting next to each other and I've popped in for the singles in post. Uh, I don't actually shoot them on set just so we can keep moving because 14 days is tough. Um, and I've been doing it 20 years and it's still tough. Uh, the other big plus for me is I have a crew I've worked with for 20 years, and they're all professionals. They do huge feature films. Uh, they do this for me. And so they all are pros at what they do and know how to move. And they all know we're on a crazy schedule, and we rock and roll. And we've done a lot of films together. So so that helps, obviously, um, quite a bit. Um, I've, you know, I've got the challenge, like everyone else, that these films are not pre-sold, quote, unquote, pre-sold. In other words, you make them, and then you sell them. Uh, which is nerve wracking. But the good news is that I've been able to sell all the films I've made to date. Knock on wood. I should knock on wood very quickly. Uh, so I'm blessed. Um, many of the films I do are thrillers with a female lead. So they tend to end up on Lifetime, which if you don't know is our women's network. Um, but I just did also an African-American romance. Um, for one of the streamers, I have some romantic comedies uh, that I'm doing three, which will go in Canada, Christmas uh, holiday fair. So it runs the gambit. It just depends um, what I develop with who. And, um, you know, they, they tend to be at that, that tight, lower budget level, 14 day shoot ish, depending. I've done as little as nine or 12 and I've done as high as 15 to 20. So um, it just depends on the project and how much money you can squeak out of the budget. Um, but right now, pretty much I'm directing and producing and writing most of what I do. Some of the projects are written by others. The ones in Canada are because to get Canadian content money, you have to have a, a Canadian writer if you have a non-Canadian director. Um, but that'll kind of give you an overview uh, of what I do sort of on the day to day, which is develop out uh, these projects. Um, on the producing side, I'm really just sending projects to, uh, you know, I'm sending, I should say, pitching uh, to studios and networks. And uh, I have one at Sony and I have one at NBC. And so I'm doing more on the producing side. I'm not directing those. Um, I'm just uh, producing. And usually on that end, I partner uh, with big producers. I partner with, you know, Peter Chernin or Mike Metavoy or uh, Lauren Chu or the Donner. Uh, these are all huge producers and it's better uh, for me to partner with them on those higher budget TV shows and feature films. Um, it just has a better chance of getting made that way. So, you, you know, it's all about packaging. Then we say it's all about packaging. It is all about packaging. <laughs> so I, I pack it on that side. Um, I don't know if you want me to open it up for some questions. I feel like I've talked forever. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Lane, for such a you know enriching talk. You know the way you shared your first-hand experiences uh, as a writer, producer, and director, and uh, you know which is very rare for an audience uh, of cinema to listen to a person who who's sort of uh, holding you know multiple responsibilities like you as a producer, writer, and director. So you know this profession well. And the topic of today, which is basically indie feature productions, you know, the, the first question in this film business, you know, it it it, it came to you know automatically you know mind you know how to sort of you know raise fund for your first feature film so if you could sort of you know uh, uh, enlighten the audience on this you know the, the kind of avenues available for them or how they can work on on their first feature film first independent feature film sure uh, i mean i think the beauty of where we are right now is that there are a lot of opportunities for beginning filmmakers that i did not have Back when I started, as I date myself, you know, you needed a DP, you needed a guy who could change a reel in a dark room, in a bag, you know, you don't need any of that anymore. You can go out and buy your own 4K camera and go shoot. Um, you know, you used to have to go to a big edit bay in a post-production house and pay for that to get editing done. And now you can edit on your laptop. So I think 
the opportunities for filmmakers right now is there. It's incredible. You, you literally can can do so much uh, with not as much money as you would think. <laughs> um, and that's a wonderful thing. You you re, it, talk about independent feature film. That is that is truly independent because you're not looking to others to raise a ton of money. Um, I've. I've seen um, a lot of these sort of, you know, GoFundMe and Kickstarter things, which I think are great. It's, you know, you basically going out and saying, here's a trailer that I shot. Here's the film I want to make. Come help me fund it to make it happen. Um, I applaud that. I think that's amazing. And of course, you can always go and also um, go to, obviously, Sundance and, you know, a lot of, I went to film festivals, many film festivals. Um, that's a great opportunity because of all the buyers that are at those film festivals. But, but the money, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised. I mean, I said in my spiel that I, I believe you sell things on passion and you do. And I think that's how you raise your money is you're very passionate about what message you want to send, what film, why do you want to make this? Why is this so vital for you? As I like to say with my log lines, what's unique about it? What makes it different? Why would somebody want to go spend their, you know, eight bucks to go see your movie or six bucks on streaming to go see your movie rather than someone else's? If you can hone in on that, um, phenomenal, because then you have a selling tool. And I think, you know, it used to be that you needed so much money to, to make a film and you really can make them on so much less these days. I think you know, everyone who wants to make a film has such a great opportunity right now. You know, of course you go out and look for money. Um, I ended up just going to companies who were making lower budget material. I went to a company who at the time, uh, Mar Vista was tiny. They were in a one bedroom thing in Mar Vista and they were making these little films. And I thought, I gotta go talk to them because they need directors, they need producers, they need people who know how to make that content and come in on time, under budget. That's the big thing. On time, under budget. Remember that's very important. Um, but uh, but now, of course, that company has four floors of a huge building in Westwood, and they're doing forty independent features a year. You know, so it grows. They always say it's your network. It's all about networking. It really is about networking. It's it's who you know, and and because everyone moves up eventually. You know, I started doing you know little itty bitty public service announcements, and now I'm doing feature films. So. Um, that's a big part of it too, but, but I don't think you should ever let the money, um, be the reason you're not making the film because there's a lot of support out there for this industry. God, especially right now, look at how much content is being consumed because we're all stuck at home in COVID. It's unbelievable. So, um, and now more than ever with the streamers and online, and there's a million places that can put out content. It's phenomenal. The the used to be like, you know, maybe eight places you could go to sell things. Now there's a, a multitude of places where you can sell things. So I, I think, you know, sort of my philosophy being keep directing until they pay you to direct. I think you keep pushing to get your money, to get your film made and make it no matter what, whether you have to raise, you know, 60,000 bucks from all your friends and family, or whether you need, you know, $400,000 from a small company that's willing to go, oh my God, I love that script. You know, find something you're passionate about. Um, and whether it's a script or a book or whatever it is, be passionate, go out and push, push, push. And, and, and you'll manage to make it because you can do a lot of it yourself these days, which is so cool. I mean, I still use a DP. I love DPs. They make everything look amazing. But if I had to, I'd go shoot it myself and you fix the color and lighting in post. Um, that's the other thing. Post-production has changed so much. It's all digital. You can change anything. You can make night look like day. I mean, it's it's the ability to make a film look amazing is, I mean, the sky's the limit right now. Um, so it's not like someone can look at it and go, oh, they didn't have any money. If you do it right. My last film was a $400,000 film. It, literally, the colorist at the post house said to me, can I guess the budget? And I said, sure. He said, let me say four or five million. I didn't say a word. I was like, let him think it's a $4 million film. Awesome. That means I did my job. If the acting's great and it looks like $4 million, I did my job. <laughs> um, one thing I would say is get a good sound person because that is the big tell of not having enough money is if your sound is not good. So that's a big plus to always do. But um, I don't know if I answered your question, but the, I guess because there's so many answers, there's so many ways to get a film made. Yeah, Just like yeah, so many ways to get in this industry. No, my question is well answered. Uh, in fact, I have one more question, you know, related to that. 
uh, what was the you know budget of your first independent film and you know how many crew members were involved my first independent film i want to say was under 200000 for sure and i think i had 20 crew members total maybe less something like that i'm old it was it was very long time ago so i have to remember now here you're putting me to the test here um but yes it was it was somewhere between 100 and 200000 and maybe there were 20 people maybe it was very small in term and we had to do it in 9 days which was crazy 9 days that is a little bit nuts for those of you who are out there that's crazy what what was the length of this thing it's full length it's full length yeah they usually they say 89 minutes so uh it was 689 minutes so it's full length yeah yeah it was uh <laughs> it was challenging i remember one day on this shoot um there was a big crash on the 101 and no one could get to the set literally as people would eke their way off the nightmare of the freeway they would make it to set so i had to sit with my assistant director and whoever showed up we would shoot their side of their scenes only <laughs> until the next person came and i actually took some of the extras were able to show up early so i recast them as speaking roles small small speaking roles because we had to shoot something we were waiting <laughs> and we have nine pages and we didn't know what to do it was it was absolutely crazy and i uh, you know that's that's what happens when you're first starting out you just go okay i'll the answer to everything is i'll figure it out we'll make it work no matter what we'll make it work cuz they don't give you an extra day because of things like that you still have nine days to make a film so you just keep shooting you know and when the one was around we were shooting like establishing shots of the building you know racking focus from one plant to another for transitions i mean you do what you got to do uh it was a little nutty okay. <laughs> it was easier actually than i think of it sure sure and sure lenny your your first film is really a very very challenging job you know which you do uh, in your life uh so you know how prepared one one should be for for his his or her first film actually because you are uh, dealing with the new crew members you are dealing with the you know whole lot of uh, uh, you know technical crew members whom you don't know well maybe you if you know them well you know don't know their working style so how did no, you join any of them except for my assistant director i didn't really know any of them oh i know my dp but that's it uh Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest skills as a director is to be able to communicate with a whole bunch of different kinds of people um because it's such an amalgamation on that set. Um that's that's challenging including actors. You have to know how to talk to actors and that's challenging as well. Um I think that's a big skill set and and how I do it is I I spend a lot of time making sure people understand that I value them. and i trust them to know how to do their job i'm not here to tell them their job i'm there here to tweak so it fits the overall picture of the film but they're here to do their job not me cuz they're the pro at whatever they do aside from that i'm i'm very in overtentive i like to show up incredibly prepared even if i end up throwing all that out the window when we get there i like to be prepared um so i could never draw you know a lot of directors use uh, storyboard artists and what not cuz i mean i just can't draw at all and i don't have the time for a storyboard artist So I do a thing called overheads. It's sort of like those things where you go to a sporting event, you see like the head captain dude and he's writing little X's and O's with little arrows on a thing uh, overhead of the court. So that's kind of what I do. I do an overhead drawing of the room that the actors are in and I, you know, have little circles with little noses and I move them around. I put little carrots for the camera and and I and I create sort of what I think the shooting's going to be. and i talk to my dp about it cuz i'll say oh all the lighting's coming from here you want to be on this side of the line whatever so we plan ahead of time plus i i love overheads cuz when we get to set i give it to the ad so he can look at them all my dp has a copy so we're all on the same page we don't have to go to set and be like what do we feel like doing today you know like we have a game plan and whether we stick to it or not we go in with a very solid game plan so that we can hopefully make our day every day that's the goal obviously it's a lot of practice yeah i am yeah. very much prepared for you know all all the uh, shooting material uh, not on, not only for the first film for the rest of it because it's a very costly business you know and everybody has come come with a cost actually so first comment you know we have received today from mr michael rust he says 
Lee, you have always been an overachiever. Oh my gosh, Michael. I went to UC Santa Barbara, my undergrad with Michael uh, as a lit major. Hi, Michael. It's been a long time. Lee says hi to you. I'm sure you are watching this play now. Uh, next question we have from Mr. C.G. Siribwa. He is a, you know, he is one of the reputed film editor and filmmaker from India. And he has graduated from, you know, one of the most reputed film school of India, Pune Film Institute. He says, how do you see Hollywood adapting itself to face the competition of OTTS and shrinking of the screen size from 35 screen to the size of the screens of laptop and mobile? I am maybe the wrong person to ask that question to. You know, I believe that it's, you know, content is king and it's all about the story and the characters and the acting. To me, I don't care what the screen size is. I don't care if it's going to a streamer or a television or a big, huge movie theater. The elements, the really strong elements that sell that story have to be good and have to be the same. The rest of it's the technical end. That's just a screen size. I think the good news about the shrinking screen is that you can get your content to tons more people than you ever could. Television and laptops being your television these days, my God, you have such a huge audience. It's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. In Hollywood, we always talk about trying to find four quadrant. Four quadrant is the widest audience possible. Mom, dad, both kids. Ages doesn't matter, genders doesn't matter, everyone is included. If you hit a wide audience like that, if you hit your four quadrant, um, you're doing well. And I think with the screen size shrinking, you're actually increasing your ability to reach that four quadrant. So to me, it's a big plus, but also I I never, you know, someone asked me about log lines. Oh, do you do a log line different for, for movies and TV? I really don't. I, I'm selling a project, I'm selling, this cool thing. And I don't care where what screen size it ends up on. I don't care if I shoot it on film or video, though I love digital. Um, I just need to have great actors and a great story and be able to tell it to the best of my ability to, to sell that to someone. Um, everything else is sort of, you know, not as important, I would say, and at least in my mind. But you're talking to an actor's director, so there you go. And producer. Uh -huh. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Uh, I'm sure Shri Gua, your uh, question is well answered. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Ashwani Gambhi. Uh, Lane, you can even watch the question on your screen actually. So I am very new to writing. Our characters can be dumb, mute, quiet in situation. But how to write characters? Inner silence. The silence in its spiritual uh, term, very pure consciousness, state of mind, out of meditation. Kindly show the way. So the tough, the tough thing with that is that film and television, it, it's a visual medium. You have to show, not tell. So how do you show that? It's a great question. And I, I would say you're talking about something that should be a book. Because if you want to get in someone's head, you have to be in a book. That's the only way. I can't show what's if you're being quiet and you're having an inner, you know, a great actor can show a moment of that, but not the whole character the whole time. It's, it's tough. I, I'm always asking myself um, when I do a film, how do I get the audience to feel what that character is feeling? Because that's the goal. If I can get the audience to feel what that character is going through, I've succeeded. It's very hard. It's very hard. It's, it's, it's all visual and you don't want to tell it. You don't want the character to be spewing everything. You want to show, you know, I think, like I said, if, if it's only, if it's one moment, um, you know, in a very powerful moment, there's a moment in a, in an old film, um, Sally Field is, is trying to teach about unions and, and to give people rights. And she ends up, she's in a, a, a big factory and they're treating everyone abominably. And she ends up, standing up with a sign that just says union. So she's trying to create a union so everyone gets treated well. And it's quiet, she says not a word. She stands up, she holds up the sign and slowly all of the machines go off until there's just silence and her standing there with the sign. That moment is quiet and it's so powerful. 
Can you do an entire movie like that? Probably not. Because we have to build to that moment and then build from there with until the changes that happen. But but if you want to create a moment with a quiet character who um, has an inner silence, um, there's a movie with Peter Sellers. I'm trying to think of where, uh, darn it, he, he plays a, a gardener and um, he doesn't speak very well. And they end up, um, they sort of twist every every silence that he has into some grand thing, like he's this brilliant, you know, and it's, it's a phenomenal film. I'm blanking on it, you have to look it up. Um, there are ways to do it. Um, the problem is at a certain point, you have a certain amount of exposition you have to get out. You have a certain amount of story you have to get out. There are things that that you have to, that have to be told. So if all you wanna do is be inside their head, I would say you're looking at a book. Um, it was one of the challenges actually of the Duff in, in the movie, the Duff that I did in the book, you're all in her head. And in the movie, we had to figure out how do you get out of her head and show? Cause it's a visual medium, very tough. Um, I'm sure actually uh, this question is well answered. You got the answer. You 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 need to feel that you know cinematic space and accordingly you know you you need to define your space and the character you are writing. And uh, Mr. Shrigua, who asked question you know a little earlier, he he appreciate your answer. He says, "Well said, ma'am. Truly agree with. Uh, have have to congratulate for your frank and bold answer." Uh, thank you. Thank so, you. We have another question from uh, Kamal Abdul Nasir. Uh, he says, uh, screenwriters are the most underrated in the hierarchy. Idea is the seat though. From ideas, piracy to reworking, is the career worth pursuing at all? <laughs> you know, I, I will answer that in the way that I look at all careers, which is if it's something that you would be doing 24 seven without anyone paying you, that's what you should be doing. If that's where your heart is, that's what you should be doing. Um, whether or not Hollywood's excited or not. Um, and look, there are bad people in Hollywood who treat screenwriters really poorly. There are good people in Hollywood who treat screenwriters really well. They make a great deal of money when they are good at what they do. Um, I, in in my producing side, will, will very much value screenwriters um, and what they bring to the table. Um, and what I try to do is actually bring in the author and the screenwriter and have them talk to each other because I feel like um, you can get some amazing things that way. Uh, whereas most of Hollywood doesn't. They take the author and they take their book and they say, thank you, here's some money, go away. Uh, I don't work like that. So it, it really depends on how, who you work with as a screenwriter, I think. Um, I value them, I think they're incredible. I actually brought up uh, the screenwriter for The Choking Game up to Canada. Um, I just wanted her to be there in case we needed some new dialogue or one of the actors wasn't happy with where their character was going or whatever. I thought it was such a benefit um, to have her there as a resource. Um, and is it worth pursuing if it's if it's your heart, if it's what you would do 24 seven for no money? Yes, you should do it. Oh, being there, somebody figured out the name of the, yes, yeah, the movie, yeah. being there. Peter Sellers says almost nothing in that film and it's phenomenal. So silence can be quite powerful. Sometimes what characters aren't saying is, is better than what they are saying. When I do casting, I always tell the actors, because they're always worried about the lines when they come into audition. They're very worried. Like, what if I mess up a line? You know, they're all freaked out. Or, oh, can I start over? I messed that up. What they don't understand is I actually don't care what they're saying. I'm looking at the spaces between the lines. When they're not speaking, are they listening to the other person reading with them? Are they reacting to what the other person's saying? That's acting. That's what I'm looking for. Lines are whatever. I, I really care about the silences because sometimes they're just phenomenal. When I'm in editing, we're always looking for moments that where they're not speaking because they can be really incredibly powerful. To that, I think we very very important you know take from your talk today, Janardhan uh, Koremula. He says bad blueprint lead to bad structure. Take away for the day. Thanks, uh, Lane Chapter Bishop. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'm very big on structure. I can tell you, it, every script I take on in any way as a director, producer, I'm looking at that structure because if it's not right, the movie is not gonna be good. You, you have to have a good blueprint, you have to. Everything else you fill in after. When I am writing a script, I actually do the structure first. I find the inciting incident, the end of act one, the midway point, the end of act two, and the denouement. And I put those elements in and then everything else I write around them to make sure that structure is there. To that. So, uh, I think 
his question was answered a few few moments before he says lynch after you have given me wow nobody have shown me the way in the film school on this question kindly accept my hearty gratitude ah oh, that's lovely thank you any further so we have different opinions on writing a log line uh, it can be on the beginning or after the project what do you think uh, the writer should create one before or after their screen play oh my gosh make sure you're at the talk on the 20th at 8:30 a.m um absolutely before 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 or you'll end up having to do a lot of rewriting um the log line i always say it's like sort of like the rudder on a boat my my book talks about this a lot um it steers you because what you're defining when you do a log line you're saying here's my protagonist here is what they want to achieve very specifically and what happens states what happens if they don't achieve it those elements are everything that is the direction of your screenplay or your book um and it it helps show you what propels the story forwards it's vital and whatever doesn't touch that log line probably shouldn't be in your book or screenplay so it also helps you sort of get rid of the fat um it's absolutely something you should do first i i'll give you a great example i was at a writers conference and this uh, author beginning author stood up and he said i wrote this book and it's about um you know that they discover that um lincoln was not shot by john wilkes booth and i said and and he said what do you mean and and i said well okay why do i care it, it, is it he's crazy and he's going to put put in an insane asylum or it's you know the truth and the world is going to change now in some horrific way because of that why do i care and he looked at me and he looked so sad and he said but um but i already wrote the whole book <laughs> i said that's why you your screen your your log line first because your log line would have told you you're missing your stakes the why do i care part what does it matter do your log line first that's my answer do your log line first you will thank me later so ashwini you need to cross the log line you should do it first kamal abdul nasir he also thank you for the answer uh, which was basically on writers uh, then janardan korumulla has one question he says uh, where do you think writing is heading in 5 years from now I don't know if it's going to be that much different from right now. I mean, we're all still sitting on laptops typing away, you know, and uh people are still writing um what they care about hopefully as Ann Perry says. Um but uh, you know, maybe there'll be more stories about uh pandemics. <laughs> I'm guessing there's a lot being written right now about pandemics. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh we have another question from Kamal Abdul Nasir. He says uh with so much emphasis on realism and factual cinema do you think the uh coloring to idea of willing suspension of disbelief will become obsolete not at all not at all when you sit down in a movie theater or you sit down in front of your tv to watch a show um anything that is um fiction you are automatically uh signing up for willing suspension of disbelief because no matter how real they uh do their best to make it look um ultimately you're seeing something that's been filmed you know so even reality tv which my husband did for 6 years so i know all the gory details of that um <laughs> is not reality you know you have a producer off screen and they're manipulating what you're watching so um you have to absolutely always have a will willing suspension of disbelief with anything that is being filmed because it's never actual reality true that even even better documentaries have a lot of manipulations so you yeah. know put camera at a particular place you know one oh, there's some crazy stuff going on in reality tv as well <laughs> <laughs> people who think that we all uh, I want to go no 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 nothing you're watching is real just so you know true that true that true that I know that I know exactly how that works true that in fact you know uh, I remember this you know very unpopular sort of uh, discussion I was having in Tehran uh, in attending this you know Fajr International Film Festival uh, there so one of the filmmaker from India he was discussing the work of Abbas Christmi this Iranian master 
uh so he was sort of you know uh, having the views on you know i don't like his work this so and so uh, because there is lot of manipulation so i asked him you know you just tell me a single work which doesn't have a manipulation tell me your best of the documentary right so every right. year there is a manipulation he has a perspective you have a perspective and everybody has a perspective on a particular shot even on a particular shot do you about the body of the whole work actually that's so, right that's right so it it can be taken into different perspective actually uh so you know uh, now we have sort of i think last question of the day today because we have already crossed 50 minutes uh, janardan karumulla he has sort of comment in fact you have awesome energy is that <laughs> magic that you spell on other to get your work done <laughs> i love that question um you know i uh, i love what i do i i know i said i said i a million times i i sell things on passion i love what i do I mean I, this is what I would do 24/7 for no money. Um that's how I know this is what I should be doing. Uh so I think that comes out, you know, actors always tease me a little bit too because when I'm on a set I'm very like, "Oh, I know what we could do. This would be so fun," you know, and they kind of look at me like, "Oh my god, she has so much energy. She needs to take a deep breath." Um but it's because I love what I do and I love, you know, we throw out ideas. It's very collaborative. You know, film and TV is so collaborative. So you have all these people who are great at what they do. including the actors and you get to be like hey let's all make something amazing together this is what's in my brain let's see if we can make that happen and you know that's god that's such a thrill i mean th- yes this is exactly how i act on set um you know it, it's it's a thrill you're you're watching a little screen and you're seeing this stuff that used to be like in your brain you know a month ago <laughs> actually occur it's it, there's nothing like it it's so it's so cool and i think you know if you can bring people into your orbit to collaborate with you that have that same energy you're going to end up with something you know amazing so yeah this is how i always act i always i always say that uh, you know to executive producers when i'm going to produce something for them i say just you know this is beyond set too so like don't think i'm going to get like all serious and stuff because this is super fun stuff we're not killing cancer we're making a movie so there you go to that to that so i think we have received one more question uh, lane ashwin gambhir he says for students uh, will you suggest some movie to watch or skip to read Uh, to practice the art of screen writing it will be great help for us oh i'm going to be so self serving go get my book because that'll help you more than anything in your screenwriting so your story in a single sentence it'll teach you how to sell cuz you know what you can be the best writer in the world screenwriter author you can be the best writer in the world but if you can't sell it it doesn't matter it doesn't do any good so you have to be able to sell it so we are going to have a two plus session with you on that particular topic as well Yes, on the twentieth at eight thirty a.m. my time, right? Yeah, we will show the details to the audience. Uh, and before we close the show, Lane, I have sort of you know one question from audience point of view. Uh, you know, to write your first film, uh, do we even need to wait for the crew members? Can because we are living in the mobile uh, world, mobile era actually now. So with the iPhone available with each and everybody, uh, shouldn't you know? uh we try our first to be through through mobile phone you know instead of waiting for the uh, crew members when when steven cronenberg can shoot a film on you know iphone you know why cannot uh, an independent filmmaker shoot you know his his or her first film on the mobile phone without even waiting for the crew members i mean as i mentioned wow what a great time period to live in you can make a phone become your camera <laughs> and it's 4k i mean that's pretty amazing um I I will say that you should not discount the value of having a DP of having a director of photography um because it's not only about this it's also about the lighting that makes your film look like a million dollars and um some of you might be able to figure out how to do that on the iPhone but <laughs> sometimes you need a real DP with a real camera to make it look like a million dollars which is always the goal um but you definitely that's you know that's one of the cool things about right now as i mentioned you can you can shoot it on your iphone you can edit it on your laptop i mean that you, you even have a, a color suite now davinci is actually available on your laptop i mean these are all things you would have to pay a lot of money for in past and go to a post house for and you know you know rent some very expensive equipment get a red or whatever so pretty amazing um that yes you you can shoot a movie on your iphone it's it's astonishing it's 4k why not why wouldn't you i mean um like i said i'd have a great dp anyway i'd have him do your lighting cuz 
boy, a good DP can can seriously make your stuff look like a million dollars. Um, they're so valuable. Um, but yes, yes, this is a great play, time to be a, a filmmaker because look how much you can do all on your own for no money. Thank you so much for being with this. Uh, we have come to the end of the session today, and thank you so much for this scintillating and enriching talk today. I'm sure this has benefited our audience immensely, and we are going to have another session from you very soon. We'll be declaring the date and the timings to the audience. Uh, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us today, uh, early in the morning in USA and at nine o'clock here in India. Uh, but audience has enjoyed this session very well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. I've enjoyed every minute. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be soon meeting uh, with the another session with Mr. Lane Chapter Bishop. Uh, till then, uh, we sort of break uh, from the show today. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back uh, with another, uh, you know, media veteran uh, in the show. That show will be at 11:30 a.m. tomorrow, and we'll be joined by you know one of the uh, very talented actor of the Indian cinema, uh, Major Alisha, tomorrow. So kindly. Uh, keep watching uh, the show on uh, Abhi channel of IMC Manu. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Till then, take good care of you. Uh, good night for today. Thank you so much.